Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kaylee Olson, the editor of LPM. Welcome to our webinar about how to roll out tech projects effectively during the pandemic. I'm joined by David Baskerville, Kevin Guzman, and Nigel Stott from Baskerville Drummond. A uh, special thanks to KISS for supporting today's webinar. And uh, we're just going to have a bit of a chat, really, today. So please feel free to engage, ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A sections at any time, and we'll be sure to pick it up. And um, at the end, uh, this is being recorded as well. So at the end, we'll circulate a recording if you've missed anything or want to send around to uh, your peers. So without further ado, why don't we start with a bit of a view pre-pandemic. Um, David, why don't you kick us off with what what was the general approach to tech projects or rolling out any project in the firm, really? What, what did you see in the market pre-pandemic? Um, just before the uh, pandemic, I think we were still going through that cycle of a lot of firms with older technology that you know they, they hadn't invested probably almost since the credit crunch. A lot of firms that uh, there's an awful lot of end of life practice management systems. There's also an awful lot of people who'd gone to like followed the cloud and gone to sort of what I call cloud version one, where they've gone to private cloud, uh, often multi-tenanted solutions. And so I think we're, we were in an evolutionary change from uh, old systems, old cloud to more modern systems and newer cloud. And that was happening anyway. Um, and I think there was, you know, there has been a lot of lip service in, in the legal market about using technology. And I think we were still in what I would call, to some extent, lip service mode that where people were adopting technology but not necessarily using it. Um, and a good example of that is to see a lot of announcements about purchase of technology and very few announcements of the ROI uh, assessment a year or two after. So I think that's where we were beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other thoughts on that? Nigel? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess kind of just looking at where we were and maybe looking at the the current situation, um, I think in terms of the general approach around projects, um, that hasn't largely changed the way we approach project management and implementation. Um, the the processes are, are pretty much as they, as they were before. Um, I think what we are seeing is some changes in the practicalities of project implementation. So, for example, where we used to have face-to-face -face meetings, um, now we're doing that largely by Microsoft Teams and Zoom, which can bring about its own challenges as well, because we've all been in those situations where we're having a, a meeting on, on Teams or Zoom, and you can see that person in the corner checking their emails rather than fully engaging in the conversation. Um, so I would say there's the, 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 the practicalities of just making sure that everybody's fully engaged um, during project calls. Um, but yeah, I, I think largely um, the general day-to-day -day approach is, is pretty much the same as, as it was. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about, I mean, I know you said it's basically the same pre-COVID as it has been now, but are, are the way that you interact with firms in, in terms of giving them advice any different? Have people, because I, I assume it's quite stressful times for everyone, especially your clients right now. Some top tech projects have been put on hold. Others are really finding that avenue for growth and really want to press on during this time. So what's what, what are those I, I would say that, um, you know, an awful lot of people stopped doing projects straight away. There was a panic, let's put everything in hold and let's just rush to find solutions to get us through this. A lot of tactical and decisions were made at a speed that you'd not normally expect to see from a law firm environment. So I think that that certainly did change. And I think that did put pressure on consultancies where we would be used to looking at information, making a proper assessment, we were been asked to give, you know, have a meeting at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning and give advice by two or three in the afternoon for a decision that normally would have taken a firm two or three weeks to make. So I think that that is certainly something that's changed. But, you know, we, we brought on, um, I think it's four clients now where we've never actually met them. And again, pre pandemic, that wouldn't have been heard of the type of clients that we work with. It'd normally be uh, the engagement process would normally be a couple of meetings, presentations, talking people through to what we're going to help them. And yeah, we've done that same process, but it has been, as Nigel said, uh, video calls rather than having to do the face-to-face -face side. And yeah, we, we've, we've brought on some, some really new, exciting clients 
uh, at a time where you naturally wouldn't have expected to be able to do that. So mm. it's it just shown that humans can interact without so much face-to-face -face time. Mm, um, the, under, the underlying way that we work is, is essentially the, the same. We, you know, we use the same processes, the same methodology, and, and, and that really hasn't changed. Um, what has changed really, I think, is, is the way that firms are recognizing you know, the need to change. And, some of them really have a, a strong willingness to change now. I think in some ways it's almost accelerated um, the speed at which we can do projects because rather than, you know, going away and, and, and thinking about a proposal and, and then dropping it for a few months, you know, there's that really real strong impetus to, to, to get on with it. And um, so even though in, in some ways it's difficult, you know, um, not meeting people as much face to face, um, you know, the process still works and, and firms really are willing to, to make decisions and proceed and get on with change. It's almost like what's happened is, is, is brought about more willingness for change. You know, people realize we're in a changed environment now and they just move forward more quickly. I think those internal barriers have been knocked down, haven't they, Kevin? Whether, you know, the, we'll make a decision at next, next month's meeting is now, well, we'll spin up a quick zoom call and we'll discuss that tomorrow yeah. and that's what i mean about those internal decision making barriers have been knocked down because people have just think we just need to do this rather than pontificate for for six months yeah absolutely um in terms of so you said you brought on some new clients during this time um have we i know we talked a little bit before when we were prepping for this about the different types of clients and if firms actually understand the challenges that they have and what solutions are out there what is your view on, I guess, how people come to you with uh, their problems? So, so we tend to have two types of clients and, you know, quite often you, you can separate the, the, those clients into, have they got already somebody who is an IT strategist working for their business? And they, these tend to be the larger firms we work with where they've got a, a very good and established lead of IT, but that person hasn't done a particular problem before. Um, so, you know, say a document management or a PMS, like a big, big scale project they've never done before or they haven't done it for 10, 15 years. They just want somebody to help and nurture them through that. And I would call them a tactical buyer of consultancy. They know the problem and know what they help, want help with and they, they will engage with the consultancy they think can, can help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And then you've got the clients who feel or know that something's not quite right or the fear that they're not keeping up with the competition, but they don't know quite what they need or how they're going to do it. So, so for those firms, it's actually sometimes harder because they know there's something wrong. You know, in colloquial terms, they, they smell something's not right, but they're not quite sure what it is and what they need to do. Um, so I guess those are the two brackets that, that I'd say that we operate in. I guess, I guess there's a there's also a lesser third category as well, which um, I think is much more rarer, and that's the category of law firm that you know they that maybe don't have any significant issues. Um, there isn't a a project that they know they need to undertake um, and get underway, but but the third category would be firms that want to do more with the technology. So there's no there's no major issues, there's no big problems, but they know they have a technology stat that perhaps they could be getting more out. And we have a closer look at the way the business is run, uh, the types of business processes that are in place, whether there's any opportunity to improve those processes, make them more efficient through the use of technology. Um, I think there's a, a real good opportunity to help law firms in that space as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have a question uh, already from uh, some of our guests. Uh, Lorna, who asks, what do you think the impact of people working from home and being more relaxed is having on communication and decision-making process? <laughs> That's an interesting one. It's, um, I, I think in some ways the, the, the relaxed atmosphere is, is, is really quite good. And um, I, th I think uh, people have been more open. I think um, at management level, uh, that's been more relaxed and, and people are really having some good free discussions on whether it's Zoom or Teams and, and feeling that they can, they can be open about things and get on with pro projects very quickly. But on the other hand, I think we have to realize that the longer this goes on, you know, as some organizations start to hire, um, they might bring on trainees, they might bring in new staff if, if they're in a fortunate position where they're expanding. And 
that's going to really change the dynamics because it's quite easy to be on a Teams meeting with people you know well. You know, you've got that rapport already. You kind of know, you know, you're comfortable with what you can say, you know, whether you can joke around with people. But if, if you start dealing now, as this goes on longer and longer with, with, with people that are new to you, that people that you don't know well, um, there's going to be a lot more chance for kind of saying the wrong thing or getting the wrong impression, not reading the body language correctly. And I, I think that's something that, um, that people are really going to have to watch out for, um, you know, because I think, I think we're going to be stuck with this for a while yet. Um, you know, a, a lot of organizations are even saying, well, they're just going to, going to close their offices and work, work remotely permanently. But even those that don't want to do that, uh, um, you know, a lot of organizations are saying they're definitely going to be working from home, you know, well into the new year now. And that will present challenges as new people come on board. And, and I think as well as that side, whilst I, th I think it is easy to get people together to have a com conversation, the, the, the short notice, let's have a meeting tomorrow morning is, is now acceptable where you know you should take weeks to get people together so that, that has helped it and whilst the communication style might be more relaxed you know we used to people working and you know the dog walks in or the kids walk in so the, there is a relaxed atmosphere but actually that does not mean that people are relaxed about making decisions and you know when you're working with it projects everyone knows they're expensive everyone knows they overrun and you know a firm a firm will make short term decisions like, you know, we're going to introduce bundling software. It's going to cost us X per user, really easy decision to make. They can turn it to and off again, but actually firms have got to make big decisions. If they're moving offices, if they, their uh, outsource arrangements come to the ends and, and just because you're working in a, in a remote situation where communication is more relaxed, it doesn't mean that the decision making process is more relaxed. And as Kevin made the point earlier, our processes have stayed, stayed the same. So it's still as important to do your, your rigorous due diligence processes, essential to know exactly what it is you're trying to buy before you go to market. And, and you know, obviously your, your, your thoughts change as you go through a selection process, but the structure of how you go about making those big decisions needs the same governance and rigor as it would in a normal office environment, just because communication is different, just not change that. Mm. Yeah, the sustainability question is definitely an interesting one, especially, you know, as you, you've mentioned, people are, are really wanting to go ahead with some tech projects, but people's changes in behavior aren't quite moving as quickly, I think. And so I'm wondering if people are going to have a burnout stage and uh, you guys as, as consultants, you know, working with many law firms, what, you're probably used to seeing different types of behavior and different dynamics in, in firms. What what would be your advice to, I guess, the long-term sustainability of working, I guess, more hybrid, remote working way? Um, if, I, if I can just say that, I mean, my observation is for the, the sort of two types of people in law firms at the moment, okay? There's, there's the ones who have worked throughout COVID and those people have been working longer hours, less holidays, there has undoubtedly been a seepage of working life into home life. And I think, you know, that, you know, we've had it, we've had some clients wanting to start work at eight, others wanting to work at six at night. And before you know it, you, your days get stretched around people's personal situations. And I, I think the long-term problem is going to get people back into working, you know, in a way that works for them for working from home, but actually working in a way that those days aren't unrelenting and, there's a couple of clients we're working with where the people who've worked through COVID are actually hitting exhaustion. And over the last few weeks, there's been a real increase in people taking holiday. And, and I think enforced behaviors of taking a break. Um, I saw a blog this week um, from someone who was saying, look, you know, all those good habits of taking an hour for lunch and going for a walk and all that have dropped off. And I think we need to see firms re-encouraging people to, to take those breaks, look after themselves don't work seven days a week, get work 12 days a week. So you've almost got the jaded people who've worked throughout and, and there are some really exhausted people out there. And then you've got people who've been on, on um, furlough schemes who are actually obviously nervous for their roles and, and they're coming back to work now. And I think there's a real, you can see the difference in firms between the ones who've got energy and because they've been frustrated at home, if you excuse that expression, and those who've been, been working too much. So I think the firm's got to do quite a bit to balance that out and encourage holidays as, as hard as that is to do at times. 
And I, I think technology is is a double edged sword in that as well, because I think whilst you know we've got great technology around you know, Zoom and Teams. Um, that's really helping us to stay in touch with our colleagues, collaborate properly. Um, what that is also doing is that starting to seep into our day-to-day -day lives more. So it's it's very hard now to put aside time to focus when you've got Microsoft Teams open, you've got a chat in one window, you've got your emails. Um, I find that you know people are more likely to make direct calls via video or Teams audio than they would pick up the phone the way they used to. Um, so I think what we need to do is we need to start learning how to how to manage the technology we're using as well to make sure that it's not becoming too intrusive. Yeah. What about that impact on tech projects itself? So people are already busy at work doing long hours, let alone the projects that they have going on on the side. How do you get people to have time for training alongside big projects or even, even smaller projects to make sure that people are using what they need to uh, to the full capacity it's definitely a challenge i think i think some firms who who were quite ready for remote working um, have adapted quickly and, and are finding that they've actually got some time to turn their hand to projects but i think in general almost any organization out there it has struggled to some extent because there's there's just been so much extra work for a management team around COVID. Um, even even if you were technically ready to to send everyone home and they could they could work from home efficiently, um, there's, there's there's been all the questions from management about you know are we going to furlough staff, uh, you know the rules and processes that have to be put in into place when uh, staff start coming back into the office. Um, looking at the, you know after their safety you know wh whether any of them need to shield and all of that has put extra pressure on, on a business um, and so while there is a, a desire now to to change and 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 to really move forward with with some of these projects I, I think time will will be a big concern um, maybe maybe more than money for for some organizations uh, time uh, and management time is, is, is going to be a struggle. And I think that's where we, we would say someone like ourselves, a consultancy can help because we can add, we can add that extra resource. We can add that extra knowledge and essentially we can, we can become the in-house project managers as well to move things along when otherwise the, the time just wouldn't be there for the management teams that are in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I want to touch on a little bit about working with consultancies like yourself. I know there's probably a few misconceptions about, I mean, price and how much involvement is needed from your side and kind of what you just give me a, an overview about kind of some of the misconceptions and how to leverage a relationship with someone like you guys. Yeah, so obviously, the, the, as soon as you hear the word consultant, everyone thinks thousands of pounds a day, Getting, getting somebody in to tell tell us our own time using our own watch and you know i'll be honest when i when i was at uh, tollers we we tried to use the the consultants as, as little as we could we looked for particular areas where they could help um uh, we were lucky in, in in the structure of the team there but the, what, what we say is we we're very honest we have a, a one rate card for all of our work we, we don't mess around with that we we pin ourselves at an associate's rate uh, in terms of hourly rate um, all of our contracts are our estimates for how long it'll take us to deliver. Um, and if we deliver in under that time, we don't charge for that work. And in fact, a lot of our clients um, we're, we're retained advisors for, and we may do as little as an hour a month or half an hour a month for them. And it's just that governance piece wants us to be, be available to review things. And other clients, you know, we, we are sort of virtual IT director roles for, and we look after their strategies to this point in the year where our involvement goes up and down. But we see our services very much there. We identify what we're going to do to help the client and we focus on on delivering that. And, you know, if there's a big project that comes along, we need more time, we'll estimate how long that will take and, and deliver it. So it should be reactive. It should be to the level that you're getting value out of what you're spending your consultant to do. And they're quite, quite often I think consultants have got a really bad name for making things a lot more complicated than they are. Because if, if you're really honest that there's only especially if you think about practice management and DMS solutions, there's only a few options in the market. Let's not make it complicated. Um, we've got a, you know, on that example, we've got tried and tested methods of selecting technology uh, and they get good results for our, um, 
for our clients, we'd rather our clients spend the money on the technology and getting people trained on how to use it and use it properly than spending their budget on consultants, giving them an answer um, for, for those to, like, what to buy in the first place. So that, that's what we're, we're doing. Cool. Uh, we've got another question from the audience from Brendan. He says, hello everyone. I'm a technical art architect from Wrigley Solicitors. Uh, we've embraced working from home and deployed uh, many new solutions, but automatic time recording is becoming a challenge in this fast moving environment. Is anyone able to recommend a solution and that works with the random nightmare of devices that bring your own devices enabled and understands what Zoom, Teams, cloud hosts applications are doing? <laughs> that's a that's a that's a really good question. I think that's that, that that's a good um, a good indication of the change in the market. So you know you've got your traditional solutions, recoup and intap time doing that, but you know to my knowledge they've not yet plugged into the to the um, Zoom and Teams platforms. I mean obviously wouldn't want to to name a particular problem without looking at a, a particular challenge, but. Um, yeah, and I like the last bit of that question where it says he wants magic, basically, and I think that's, <laughs> I think that that would be a magical solution. But yeah, th th there are several um, new time recording solutions on the market um, that will help you record time. You know, very much in that. I, I use Recoup as an example because that was the one that's probably most well known. So it helps you identify the holes in your your bracket. But there are some new emerged web-based solutions that do a similar thing and they're probably quite likely to have that and we, we'll drop Brendan a, a, a email directly on that to, to follow that question up. Yeah um, just to dive a little bit more into picking solutions and kind of auditing tech what what are you what's your guys's approach and advice to law firms that are unsure of even you know what what solutions are out there to solve their problem how do they I guess workflow the from the problem to let's buy the solution. What's that map look like to you guys? I guess we always we always start every project the way IT projects should be done. You know, it's it's not about solutions; it's about requirements, and it's really about speaking to people. And traditionally, we would have gone into the organization to do that. Now it's remotely, but it's it's getting a, a broad spectrum of, of the organization in front of you to really talk about the problems that they're having um, and, and, and what they think needs to be resolved. You can talk to partners and they'll say one thing, secretaries will say another, um, different different departments, um, different legal teams will, will have different issues as well. So you really need to get that broad spectrum uh, of, of what it is that people are trying to achieve. Once you know what those issues are, what those requirements are, it's it's only once that's documented that you you know you actually go out and, and start looking for, for solutions. And you know, while we, we've got good knowledge of, of what's available in the, in the marketplace. I mean, oftentimes we'll recommend that a firm actually get, get a few companies in to demonstrate the products because then the firm can start to see what's available, um, get an idea of, of what might be possible. It's, it's really hard if, you know, you, it's, you know, the saying is you don't know what you don't know, but if you can see kind of what might be available out there then that gets people's thinking going and they they can they can think oh actually yeah we we, we want something that does that so we often recommend that, that firms actually get a couple of suppliers in quite early just to do some demonstrations uh, even if it's not the you know the long list of suppliers that, that we might eventually put forward um, and then and then from there we you know we would shortlist and um, and really help the organization through the whole process of finding the right solution to meet their specific needs I think it's a, a really challenging one as Kevin said the, the the absolute crucial thing is is what are you trying to achieve as a business forget about what technical sales people are saying they can deliver for you because the, I think there's two major reasons for disappointment in technology for, for law firms is the first that law firms and lawyers particularly remain optimistic that, that there is a real drive to want to use technology and i think that then leads to sometimes the complexity of technology projects being underestimated 
and secondly for that they fall for everyone else is doing ai let's use that as an example everyone's jumping on the ai buzz a loads of noise about it well actually when you drill into what those systems are those systems at the moment are pretty much around automating processes um so uh, it's um it, it's those sort of conversations like no, don't jump for solution jump for what your problem is and what you're going to benefit from doing it absolutely remains the critical point in any project i think what's really interesting about those conversations sometimes is uh you know you can start off with a perception that you have one problem but in actual fact you realize that the problem may may lie elsewhere or you need um supplementing technology to improve the process or the challenge that that you're having a look at so it's really interesting the way sometimes these conversations start in one area but then transgress off somewhere completely differently yeah. i would like to bring up from the audience so uh, dave says he totally agrees uh, his users start conversation with i need the cheat to well, how do you approach those conversations in law firms or um, people might be changing their mindsets now with technology but there are still people, you know, we're creatures of habit. We like to hold on to things that we're familiar with. So how do you approach, I guess, introducing new ways of working or, or just talking around the firm to see, get a, get a view of what might be, I guess, the way forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I need a spreadsheet to do is, is typical. And it, it's one of the, again, um, just using practice management systems is, is, is probably the easiest example of this quite often you'll, you'll find people saying uh, our systems are rubbish they don't support us and they go and buy another system then they spend a year making it work exactly as the system they they, they just got rid of um so I, I think this goes back to the point kevin made about people not knowing what's possible what other firms are doing what what, what they could really be benefiting from and i guess if somebody came to us and say we need a spreadsheet to do we would concentrate on the to do and then walk backwards as to why they think they need a spreadsheet to do it. Or, you know, could they not use project planner instead of a spreadsheet It's a silly example, but again, it's just because people are used to using Excel for, for, for everything. A lot of conversations do start in that way that, you know, I need something to do. Um, but it's just working out what that to do. And I think the bit that people don't think about enough when they have that, I want something to do. It's the, it's the why and when, um, so you know the priority uh, and the impact on the business for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to um, talk a little bit about cloud. Um, we're seeing a general trend. We do legal IT landscapes research every year, and we've kind of mapped out SME legal markets appetite in different cloud uh, solutions, and, and whether they're on-prem, mainly on-premise, uh, or half and half cloud-based. And we've generally seen that. SME firms are moving toward a more cloudy future, but um, I, I, I expect that many people still don't know the pros and cons, the differences between what is public, what is private, what's a hybrid solution that's best for our firm. So could, could someone give us just a brief overview of exactly what those terms mean and what you would recommend for different types of firms? Uh, Nigel, I can start. I, I, I can start there. So I, I think I think initially a lot of a lot of people moved to private cloud, and I think there were I, I think what we've seen is there are organisations out there who are tied to a particular uh, solution, a particular provider, and uh, probably their contracts maybe haven't been set up very well either especially when it comes to exit clauses and it there are a lot of costs then if, if an organization wants to move away from one solution and uh, uh, take their data the systems elsewhere they're finding that that's quite a cumbersome and expensive process um, suddenly there's a lot of cost to, uh, associated with moving their data so um, uh, I think um, you know there are a lot of solutions out there now that that, that can can help to uh, mitigate that. Um, apart from the contractual elements, and you've got uh, uh, solutions with Microsoft uh, 365 and Azure. Um, we, we've seen we've seen organisations um, moving to the cloud, and obviously it's uh, a, a good solution to consider if you're not already doing it, especially in these times of, of remote working. Um, it makes access to systems and data 
um, data sharing, collaboration, all of those things uh, much easier to achieve. And also integrating, you know, systems, uh, things like phone systems uh, can, can sit in the cloud as well and uh, making it easier for people to make calls, uh, you know, wherever they are, uh, in the office, from home, whatever. So um, def definitely a trend that we're, we're seeing more and more of and that, it, that makes sense in the current environment. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to cloud, one of the areas we've seen where, where firms can miss a trick is a lot of firms have moved their email from on-premise email systems into the Microsoft cloud using Microsoft 365. And what we've started to discover is that in Microsoft 365, there's a wealth of technology available, technology that can help with collaboration, automation and security. Um, so, you know, products like Power Automate, Power Apps, and firms need to have a look at these technologies and start to understand how they can be utilized because there's so much that can be done to improve just basic business processes. You know, I've seen before where firms implement sometimes very expensive third party applications like expenses software, but then using the applications that are available in Microsoft 365, that kind of functionality is available out of the box, usually at no extra cost. So I think there's, there's an opportunity when looking at cloud technology to understand more about the, the standard Microsoft offering because there is a lot out there now. Um, and, and I think the uh, I touched right at the beginning of this is, is is what I call cloud versus one. That that the the worst of all scenarios is to be on a private cloud, multi-tenanted environment where you have no control. If if a different client is doing a, is using a lot of resources, your users get um, get performance issues. So I, I think those early adopters of cloud of, of, of some of them had a real torrid time. Some of them have done well but but we have done quite a lot of projects moving people from that private cloud multi-tenanted environment to either be on public cloud microsoft azure 365 or into private cloud when they're a single uh, tenant which and the nuanced difference is that it's put simply is if you're on a multi-tenanted platform and you want to introduce new technology that can sometimes take months because the vendor doesn't want to change their infrastructure to adopt that so we, we would sort of like say, you know, cloud is fantastic, all the reasons that Kevin said, but actually it's about your your um, your flexibility when you're there because the cloud is not the answer to everything. And, and equally, and I know it's it's really serious seal, saying this to law firms, but we have found some horrendous contracts that law firms get themselves into. So if you are doing a cloud project, we would advise that you, you either engage with a consultant who can give you best practice or you engage with another solicitor who can advise you of your exit points. Because quite often we, we come to a situation where somebody's in a five-year deal, they started off with one deal, then they did something else, and they get a different deal which has got different terminus points, and you simply cannot afford to buy yourself out of this situation you're in. So we, we've got some tactics to help firms with that, but you know it can get very messy. So your contracts, are essential and the two areas you absolutely nail in are your SLAs and your exit terms because quite often the vendor will turn around and try to charge you 20, 30 days of engineering time to get your own data back out of their platform. So, you know, it, it, it is fantastic technology if it's done right. I think some of those um, barriers to, to go into cloud, the, the fear around contracts and getting stuck into the wrong provider might be a, stopping some firms from moving to the cloud. Do you think there will ever, especially considering everyone is moving to cloud slowly more and more anyway, do you think there will be a time where on-premise will be necessary at all? Um, I think there are some some applications which will still always benefit from on-premise. Um, the, the ones that jump out are things like um, print management solutions. You tend to need a, a local server to deal with print jobs cloud it works but it's a little bit you know can be slow to deliver the jobs to the printers especially with follow me printers and for for large firms things like managing your your, your logins in the morning uh, again it's probably good practice still to have something on site but there are many clients um who have nothing on site now and i think that that will become a lot more normal than it is now and apart from the applications themselves i mean one of the major issues is security and Having equipment on premise, uh, even 
even some of the largest firms, you know, have relative, relatively a small teams that look after IT security. Um, often it's people who who dabble in it, do it as a part of their job. Um, whereas, you know, in a in a proper cloud environment managed by a large organization. Uh, you've got you've got people there who are experts, and while it used to seem like the safe thing to have your data on site where you could see it, um, the reality is is lots of other people can probably see it as well because you know if if you've not got your security right, you're at risk of having it hacked into, and and um, you're vulnerable. So, uh, really, being in the cloud is is a much more secure environment for law firms as well. Mm -hmm. A little, bit, a little bit about what you guys see the new normal to be. So whether that is more cloud, more remote working. Um, what I guess um, um, after how are you going to work with clients in the future? And do you think clients' demands are going to change any more than they are right now? Do you, I'm worried that firms might regress back to days pre-pandemic. That's still a possibility. So I guess what what are your thoughts around what's in the future this is for us? Uh, I think what we're going to see around this is we're going to see more of a hybrid situation. So I think, you know, remote working, as we know at the moment, is um, definitely here to stay. Um, I think some of the main challenges that I've seen really is how we adapt operations that we were used to carrying out in the office environment in the remote working environment. Um, you know, at the start of the pandemic, printing was a big issue. We saw a lot of law firms that were still... Um, printing out correspondence and other documents in the traditional way to clients, sending out the, that via post. And then we quickly had to find ways to adapt to sending that data out electronically. But in that rush to do things, um, sometimes mistakes get made and things get missed. So I think, again, it comes back to this business process thing I've mentioned before, where I think, you know, we really need to look long and hard at our existing business processes and understand how we adapt those for the new working environment and then how technology can play a part in delivering those. Yeah, I think the the genies are like the bottle. I, um, you know, we again, Kevin mentioned earlier, we, we're working with two firms uh, who are central London based. One of them has decided to give up all their offices. Um, you know, they they are going to look for a meeting room style arrangement rather than having um, offices in, in the in the city. And another one who was due to do an office expansion is actually not going to be doing that anymore. So I, I think firms are are sort of realizing that that fee owners can be as effective away from the office, and I think the focus is then going to change as how do we manage things like risk management, compliance, and obviously there are still some departments which are very paper heavy, and I think that that sort of like management of incoming paper, um, a lot of regional firms hadn't haven't done scanning; it's been ad on an ad hoc basis. So I think we will see true digitalization being the focus over the next couple of years, as as these as these working practices become established and embedded. I don't think we're going to be going back to to as we 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 are we, we're, we're pre. So. Mm -hmm. Going back to, to what I was saying earlier about you know getting new staff on board, um, as David mentioned, you know there are risk and compliance issues as well. Um, you know it's always been, I guess, traditional that um, new trainees come in, new employees come in. You, you know if you can stand over them as it were and and keep an eye on them, um, there's there's a lot of comfort in that. But um, if they're sitting at home then you know how do you do that and, and there'll have to be management processes around that and 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 work processes may may have to change now obviously it can help to some extent you know if you have really good strong case management in place then you know the process is there um, you can see when activities are not being done when they're not being done on time um, but there's still that trust element and I, I think there will be a little bit of bounce back. Uh, I think people will realize there's nothing quite like, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. There's nothing like the, those chats around the proverbial water cooler. Um, you know, those things, I, I think we will see some of those coming back, but, but definitely remote working's here to stay as well. Yeah. Uh, pick up on some of those printing points. Uh, we have a question from Steve who asks, What's the experience of printing at home and controlling that? Are you having people do that securely uh, using Office Print? Office Print question. What's that look like? Yeah, so um, that's 
that's been a huge challenge. Uh, the way I've seen that approached is obviously there's a, a data protection and uh, risk aspect around printing from home. At the end of the day, if documents have been printed out, we never quite know where, where they're ending up. So I've seen firms take the approach that uh, printing at home has, has been stopped, but then you have to give the, um, the user something back to um, uh, give them the ability to print what they need. So um, the way I've seen that handled is by using uh, Fold Me printing technology. So if anybody wants to print anything, uh, that can be printed out to an office printer. And when that person is next in the office, uh, they, they can pick it up. I think the the thing is old habits die hard, don't they? And, um, you know, for us who've been in the industry for, for 20 odd years, then uh, there, is, there is always a certain comfort in printing something out to review it because that's just what we're used to doing. So um, it is really just striking that balance between managing risk, but then accepting people that, accepting people have habits and ways of working um that we need to accommodate as well so it's um it, it's a tricky one yeah and I, i've got we've got some clients who've taken the view that actually people shouldn't be printing from home because of those data protection um issues and uh, what they've done is they've done it so that there is a team on site who will take that printing and either dispatch it or they will send it um to the to the fee and at their home address which you know is delayed or if somebody wants to make notes is is awkward um but yeah i mean each firm has had to look at that in their own risk and compliance way so um the firm i just mentioned what they've done is say that that the partners and uh, senior fee owners are allowed to print from home but but not no one else is so you have to look at that and, and decide your particular risk and then other um, firms I'm aware of are looking to outsource to uh, like a, a, a post handling company who will scan all incoming and actually package and dispatch all outgoing. So I, I think it, it, you know, the, the question from Steve there is how are you dealing with it? I think, you know, there is no right or wrong answer. You have to look at it on a firm by firm and potentially um, person by person basis as to whether you're happy for them to, to print into the home environment, given your data protection law. So, you know, a lot of a lot of firms have now said you should not be taking the paper file home. So th the view of the firms who've said that is like, well, we can't create the paper file in your home either. So um, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers that, Steve. I think there's also a, a wider risk uh, challenge with people just working remotely anyway. If we dig a little bit deeper into that conversation, into that question, uh, how how do you know what people are doing at home is secure and, and you know? within your compliance and regulation what i guess is that something crim should be auditing their people and asking are you working in the best way possible are you you know still being compliant yeah it's a really hard one you know, i'll give a, an example i've used before and it's one of those things that as a, an it person you, you you don't necessarily think about so you know most firms obviously having to onboard new clients um remotely and the way that most firms are doing that is they'll say to the, the new client, we need to see you. We need to have a, you know, you sit there and hold us your passport and we'll take a photo to prove we've seen you. You know, obviously there's solutions coming on board now to help firms, but they weren't there three or four months ago or, or you know, weren't as available. And um, we had this, this situation where that was what was happening. But then the, the lady who was doing the, um, the, the AML process was then taking a photo on her private phone and emailing it to herself because she hadn't realized about print screen. And it's those sort of things that you, you sort of like you, you you sort of don't think about. You just assume that everybody knows how to do things like print screen, and you wouldn't have thought that somebody would take a photo on their thing. So straight away you've got a, a data protection breach because that's on somebody's mobile. It's gone into their um, their camera roll on their iPhone, so it's up in the iCloud, and it, it's actually a photo of a client and their passport. And and obviously that's actually quite a serious breach that you've lost control of that information so i think those are the sort of lessons that firms have learned in their in their reaction stage and that's why we said earlier about they're now going into okay how we do we make this for long term so i think those providers of online aml there's facial recognition and things like that are going to be coming for the fore as people bed down into this new way of working yeah, absolutely um i guess just look at this overall experience and what firms are going through. Uh, a lot of our audience, people who read LPM, are of very different uh, types of firms. Some are specialists. Most of them are um, SME firms who probably don't have IT directors. So I'm wondering how 
all of these firms, their challenges are so different. Um, you as a consultant probably seeing and, and approaching all of these different people, what, what's your advice and how do you approach different people to look at? Let's just look at your entire business and, and see what we can do to help or let's see what this problem is and work it out, you know, stage by stage. What, I, I, I want to know how do you do it differently for each different type of client? Is it different? It, it can, it is different. Every client is different. Um, I think initially the approach is dictated by the organization themselves. They usually say that, you know, we, we want you to look at this particular problem or, you know, we need some new software to, uh, to do such and such. But, um, uh, you know, it's up to us then to then guide that discussion essentially. And sometimes it is very clear, you know, an organization can have a, you know, a very strong, a very skilled internal IT team, very strong management team. And it may be that we're just, you know, we're there to advise on a particular software selection. Um, maybe it's something that they haven't done in a while that their IT team is, for example, never replaced a practice management system. Or maybe they've just got enough on that they just need that extra, you know, that extra resource to come in externally and, and, and to provide that extra time and extra knowledge. Um, but there are other cases, obviously, where, you know, once, once we're speaking to them, we, we realize actually, you know, it, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg or, or actually the problem that they think they've got, it's, it, it's really shifted over, you know, over here. It's, it's something else. It's the actual cause of the issue. Um, and sometimes, sometimes they think they've got a problem with a particular, particular piece of software. Um, but in actual fact, <clears throat> the other the other types of software, the other vendors in the market really aren't going to provide anything much different. And it's really more about making best use of what they've got, um, implementing the, the, you know, the latest uh, enhancements that that supplier has offered uh, and, and, and training their staff. A lot of times staff maybe weren't trained up originally or, you know, they've, they've had a lot of new staff um, into the firm since the, the product was originally implemented and people just haven't been properly trained on the product. So we always find it's, it's very much driven by the discussions that we have internally as to, to how we actually approach a project. I ask because I'm usually interested in, in finding out if there are certain sectors or, or practice areas that do things very well that other practice areas might not fully understand, for example, conveyancing is really busy right now. You know, there are lots of innovations in conveyancing space, but now people are kind of hitting a roadblock of too much space and not enough leveraging of technology. So things like that, are there specific practice areas or, or specialisms that I guess full service firms can learn from the way they work? I, I think, yeah, I think it varies, to be honest. Um, I think it very varies on the firm. I think it varies in terms of the kind of processes you already have in place. Um, I wouldn't say that there was um, something from what I've seen uh, a common a common theme. No, I think that's right. I think one of the one of the issues I think in a regional firm is is there still is silos in in adoption, and um, you know I think yeah, it's a cliche really, but conveyancing has to be workflowed or, or managed efficiently to make it profitable but but all those working practices rolled out to say commercial property who do you know, some elements of the same work maybe in a different way no they're not and um, I think that that is one of the the challenges there that work will remain siloed um, I, I think there are more areas in, in, in common working practice than, than people sometimes imagine and the way that teams work is so you know one of the examples i was being given is family and employment actually work quite similarly that you know it's a you know that just the way that the the the, the op operate is, is similar but you know is there anything you can leverage then then no i think that is a a, a challenge at the moment still yeah. i think there's certainly different types of firms so you know some of our clients are just focused on one area of the law you know, they're just um, litigators or just corporate. I, I think that makes it easier to, to embed technology across that firm because you're not, you're not fighting those silos. So I think that, that is an, an important point there. Yeah. Um, just for our last few minutes, um, we've talked about uh, quite a lot on our conversation today from uh, remote working, cloud, contracts. Um, 
what are you, let's just go around um, each of you. What are your key takeaways from people watching this today? What What's one thing that they should go away and look at um, their firm, whether that's an audit on security, IT, or, or better training their people? What's your one takeaway for the firms today? Uh, I think, I think for me, I think, I think just planning is, is essential. Um, I, th I think if you're looking at certainly at, at projects um, that firms want to achieve, um, it's, it's just so important. Planning has always been important. It's always been the key element of any project. But now um, you, you've kind of got that extra time that's required to, um, to do things when people aren't sitting around the table together. Um, and I think probably for any, any IT project, Again, training's always been important, but it's absolutely essential to get that element right. And we, we have found, we, we have implemented uh, projects uh, during lockdown and, and actually been able to achieve the training element as well. Um, we've shown that uh, remote training can work. And, and again, it's just so essential to, to, to plan all of that well in advance. You've, you've got to really, make sure that you can deliver that training remotely. And, and that, that takes a lot of um, planning in terms of how you organize that training, how you're going to deliver it you know, electronically, um, how you're going to keep people involved and engaged, how you're going to check that they've, they've picked up on the knowledge, um, that they've actually absorbed it, that they're not just sitting sitting at home, kind of nodding their head, and, uh, and then they've not got, a, you know, not got a clue what they're doing. And, on the day that you implement. So I, th I, think, I think planning and training are two really, really key elements. I think technology, it's, it's never evolving thing. And, you know, I mentioned before the fact that a lot of firms have access to new Microsoft technologies. I think it's worthwhile. You know, I don't want to use the word innovation because uh, I think that's been um, overused now. But I certainly think it's worthwhile looking at the way the business operates, the way internal business processes run, identifying opportunities to deliver a more effective service back to the client using these technologies. And as I mentioned before, a lot of these technologies are already in the business. They're already there. They're already waiting to be used. So I would certainly recommend to take time out to explore those technologies, what they can do for the business. Um, you know, things around automation uh, artificial intelligence um, the way we collaborate you know how can we how can we use that technology better um, to deliver a more effective working environment for the end users but also deliver that back to the client as well yeah. I think your, your, your question there was was you know what are the key takeaways about how you implement technology remotely as well um, so I, th I think one thing I would say is, is have confidence you can do it. Um, you know, you, as Kevin said, you need to plan it and make sure you resource it properly. And I think that's that, that's the probably the bit that people do. And we touched on it earlier. Is actually, you know, if you're going to train out a new system and it's going to take X days internally, it's probably going to take it X days plus a little bit externally because webinar style training does seem to take a little bit longer with a few techie problems, et cetera, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. So, you know, two or three weeks into the uh, UK lockdown, we, we took a firm live on a new practice management system and a new hosted platform and did everything as Kevin said, did all the training for that remotely and it has gone down extremely well. So I, I think in terms of leveraging external help, that, that particular firm has, has said they, they wouldn't have done it without our experience. I think that's where external help can help. It's that, you know, we've, we've done a system go live like that, you know, probably two or three times a year for the last eight years where that firm had just done it once. I think it was the first time they changed their PMS for nearly 20, 25 years. So where you, you are leveraging external help is to fill the gaps of experience you've not got internally. It's to, to steal, if you like, the best practice that that person can, can bring to you and to say leverage their experience but i think the main takeaway is don't think you can't do it you just need to um, be realistic about your your time frames ensure that management make the time available for the staff to get their training ensure that the people who are making decisions about how the system can operate have got the thinking time to ensure that they're making the right decisions so all of the same challenges with implementing technology exist. It's just a different way of doing it and, and it can absolutely work well. Great, well, I think that's a great place to end it. Thank you, David, Nigel, Kevin, for joining me today. I think it was some really good nuggets there for firms to take away.
especially the, you know, you can do it just because things are a bit chaotic at the moment. The future is bright, I think, for firms. So thank you so much. And thank you to KISS for uh, sponsoring this webinar. We will be circulating a recording after this and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you.